It's the impact of vessel size on midterm outcomes after percutaneous transluminal angioplasty for isolated de novo superficial femoral artery disease by Dr. Hipil Chang, or Chang uh, and colleagues from NYU and Columbia University. Dr. Chang. Good morning. My name is Hipil Chang, and I'm a vascular surgery fellow at NYU. First, I would like to thank Vascular and Endovascular Surgery Society for allowing us to present our work entitled Impact of Vessel Size on Midterm Outcomes After Percutaneous Transluminal Angioplasty for Isolated De Novo Superficial Femoral Artery Disease. We have no relevant disclosures. The prevalence of peripheral arterial disease has been rising, affecting approximately 200 million people worldwide and 8 million in the United States. Superficial femoral artery is the most common location of lower extremity atherosclerosis resulting in PAD. Advances in endovascular technology in the last two decades have expanded the, treat the options for treating SFA disease percutaneously. The Society for Vascular Surgery recommends endovascular approach as a first-line therapy of focal SFA disease for patients with claudication. In patients with a chronic limb-threatening ischemia, Endovascular revascularization is recommended in, in high-risk patients with advanced limb threat. In order to improve outcomes after endovascular revascularization, multiple studies have demonstrated factors associated with worse outcomes. These include lesion-specific factors, such as transatlantic inner society consensus classification type and status of runoff, and patient-specific factors such as diabetes mellitus, end-stage renal disease, and female sex. In order to improve efficacy and durability of such an intervention, it is imperative to identify factors affecting outcomes. Published data evaluating the impact of vessel diameter on the outcomes after endovascular revascularization of the SFA are limited. Therefore, we investigated the impact of SFA diameter using balloon treatment diameter as a surrogate on outcomes of patients undergoing elective PTA for isolated SFA disease. This was a retrospective analysis of a prospectively maintained SVS vascular quality initiative database from January 2010 to December 2018. The database identified patients undergoing an elective PTA for an isolated de novo occlusive SFA disease. Based on the diameter of the angioplasty balloon as an indirect measure of vessel size, patients were stratified into two groups. Group one was less than five millimeters and group two was equal or greater than five millimeters. A PTA was performed using plain and or special balloons. Special balloons included drug-coated lithoplasty and cutting balloons. Data including demographic characteristics, medical history, procedural data, and 18-month outcomes were collected for analysis. The primary outcomes were primary intervention patency, and major adverse limb event at 18 months. Secondary outcomes included technical success, post-operative length of stay, and in hospital mortality. Of over 17,000 patients undergoing PTA for occlusive SFA disease, 1904 patients met our inclusion criteria and were included in final analysis. Exclusion criteria included acute limb ischemia, symptomatic disease as the indication for revascularization, non-elective nature of revascularization, having prior SFA treatments, and missing long-term follow-up information or missing primary outcomes. The mean age was 67 years and 51% were male. Patients in group two were more likely to be male and Caucasian with higher proportions of hypertension and coronary artery disease. The remainder of the patient characteristics and medical comorbidities were similar. The proportions of prior ipsilateral or contralateral major amputations and peripheral vascular interventions were not significantly different between the groups. There was a higher prevalence of chronic limb-threatening ischemia in group one compared to group two. Preoperative P2Y12 inhibitor use was more prevalent in group two. The distribution of task classification type and the rest of the anticoagulation and any platelet regimen was not different between the groups. The mean balloon size in groups one and two were 3.9 and 5.5 millimeters respectively. 
there was no significant difference in the distribution of balloon types used. Plain balloons were used more frequently than special balloons in both groups one and two. Post-operative length of stay, technical success, and in-hospital mortality were not statistically different between the groups. Kaplan-Meier curves of the primary patency and major adverse limb events are shown here. Primary follow-up was available in all patients with a median follow-up time of 14 months. The cumulative primary patency and major adverse limb events at 18 months were 65% and 27% respectively. Primary patency at 18 months were significantly lower in group one compared to group two. Major adverse limb event was higher in group one than group two. The control for discrepancies in the procedural indication between the groups. Subgroup analysis with respect to the procedural indication was performed. Kaplan-Meier curves of primary outcome stratified indication for procedure are shown here. Among patients with claudication, there was no significant difference in the rates of primary patency and major adverse limb events at 18 months. In patients with chronic limb-threatening ischemia, group one had significantly lower 18-month primary patency and higher major adverse limb events than group two. At multivariable analysis, balloon size less than five millimeters, treatment length greater than 10 centimeters, chronic limb-threatening ischemia, and task types C and D were associated with increased risks of primary patency loss. Balloon size less than five millimeters, treatment length greater than 10 centimeters, chronic limb-threatening ischemia were associated with an increased risk of major adverse limb event, while P2Y12 inhibitor use was protective. In conclusion, our results suggest that in patients undergoing endovascular intervention for isolated de novo SFA disease for chronic limb-threatening ischemia, a smaller SFA diameter was associated with worse primary patency and major adverse limb event. As such, patients with smaller SFAs appear to be at an increased risk for treatment failure and warrant closure surveillance. Furthermore, these patients may also be considered for alternative approaches, including open revascularization. Or to any questions or comments you may have. Okay, thank you for that uh, interesting talk. And I think it does reaffirm what many of us believe that uh, smaller balloons do lead to higher failure in uh, SFAs. I, I didn't see it in your talk. How many of these patients actually had atherectomy or some other uh, treatment along with POBA? Because you'll, you'll find now that almost every treatment uh, option that comes out there, they compare with plain old balloon and angioplasty alone because it's got the worst outcomes. Okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, approximately 12% of these patients actually had the atherectomy done. Um, so it was a, a pretty minority of these patients. So initially, we included atherectomy as one of the uh, uh, variables when we performed the multivariable analysis, but we did not see that that affected uh, uh, the primary and the secondary outcomes in our study. In your practice, do you commonly just do plain old balloon angioplasty for task C and D lesions? Because I know in mine, uh, it usually requires some other adjunct, whether a stent or uh, a drug coated balloon or something else. Yeah, I certainly agree. Um, you know, for high lesions like, you know, with uh, especially with very calcified lesions, I think atherectomy has certain benefits, although, you know, there's really not much in literature that really compares uh, between, I, I believe, you know, as far as what I've seen so far uh, during the fellowship, um, atherectomy, I think, is a good adjunct uh, for a very calcified uh, stenotic lesions and uh, certainly would consider that as, as a adjunct to um, balloon angioplasty. It's, it's interesting that uh, critical limb ischemia was a uh, predictor of failure over claudication. Is that more of, do you think, a clinical outcome then that, uh, or do you think that people were actually looking at uh, failure of the, the treatment itself? I think uh, the patients with uh, chronic limb threatening ischemia are uh, a special group of people, which, you know, looking at multiple other uh, factors, uh, I think they, they certainly have um, 
different character characteristics as compared to patients who present with claudication. Um, again, uh, I think one of the, the problems that we had uh, looking into the, uh, the VQI database was that approximately 37% of these patients uh, had the missing ABI, uh, which I think would play a, a, a very uh, important factor into looking at these um, uh, primary outcomes. And uh, certainly, have, if we had such a, uh, information in all patients, I think we would have been able to prove uh, in certain way that you know a patient with a claudication versus a chronic lymph-threatening ischemia are, are uh, very different entities. But um, looking at just the, the variables that we've seen, um, we saw that the primary outcomes were different. Um, however, I think it's difficult to tell. All right, Dr. Janko asks, uh, we've heard about IVIS benefits and patterns of use in this conference. Do you know if IVIS was used in your series and maybe it should be for, especially for patients with smaller balloons? Thank you for the question. Uh, I believe IVIS was actually one of the variables that were captured within the, uh, the peripheral uh, infrainguinal um, uh, PTA database. However, we did not actually specifically look at the IVIS um, as a variable. I think it would be an interesting to see whether that does make any difference. Uh, but in our study, uh, we didn't specifically look at the, uh, the IVIS. Why did you use the cutoff of less than five? I mean, there's obviously a 4.5 balloon. So you're looking at basically fours and threes in the SFA, which are pretty small. Did you look right. at fives versus six and seven to see if there was a difference there? Yeah, so uh, we didn't specifically perform a LOC curve or an RC curve or anything like that, but we did actually uh, looked at different uh, cutoff as the uh, 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 in order to uh, find the different groups, and we've looked at uh, I believe three, five, seven. We've looked at less than four, three point five. Uh, these variables actually did not meet any statistical significance when we looked at those primary and secondary outcomes. Um, there was a study uh, from Japan that wasn't done a few years ago. They looked at uh, their own uh, homogeneous population um, in a retrospect multi-center uh, study, and they used a uh, four millimeter as a cutoff. And I think, you know, it, certainly I think we're looking at a different population, um, an Asian population versus a, a multiracial population that's in the uh, VQI database. But specifically looking at the VQI, um, the five millimeter cutoff was uh, where we found the, uh, the differences. Yeah, it was, well, it's less than five, right? Because it was five and above was what was your positive outcome. Uh, so I, I guess it would be interesting to see if five and below, so it'd be fives versus six and seven, uh, if that would make a difference. Because there was early literature, this was back in 2000s, 1999, where they uh, were saying that if you had a six or seven, that did better than fours and fives. And that sort of drove the way that we were taught to treat these. Thank you. All right. Do you think uh, that really the outcome of the study is that we shouldn't be leaving people with a five or with a four angioplasty? You should at least angioplasty everybody to five to have a better outcome? I believe um, it, it certainly depends on the indication for treatment for a patient with uh, chronic limb threatening ischemia. I think your, your treatment modality should be quite aggressive. Um, I think balloon angioplasty is certainly one of the things that you could uh, consider even in patients with less than five millimeters. I think a lot really depends on the patient factors, including um, you know, their obesity. You know, I think there are certain limitations to performing straight to the, the bypass as opposed to balloon angioplasty. Uh, another thing that we didn't look at in this specific study was uh, the, the utility of uh, a stent. Um, and I think you know, that would be a follow-up study looking specifically at a population uh, essentially the same, same group of patients and looking at whether the stent plays any role um, with the uh, different uh, size group area. All right, excellent presentation. And now I'll send it back to Jason for the final talk.